And that's Leon Harris. Leon, where are you? Right here. Raise your hand. Leon was with a, together with a colleague named Will Braves, founded the pension system. And uh, years ago, they were at 29,000. What are you at now, Leon? Uh, moving up to 30,000. 30,000 pension statements that are actually transcribed and annotated. So whenever you go into the, any work in the Southern campaigns, you have to use the pension statements because instead of the great historians or generals from the top down, it's the average people from the bottom up. And there's tons of nuggets in those 30,000 pension statement applications. Um, but his colleague, and he's about to come up to speak, and his colleague, of course, has been mentioned several times, is Charles Baxley. But, uh, and I'm not gonna relate the anecdote about what happened in 2004 when we created the Southern Campaigns. But here's the two comments I do wanna make in a more explicit way about Charles and where we are today. Can you imagine Charles with sitting around my kitchen table, the two of us, who could not write a, a, a Southern Campaign on 12 pieces of paper uh, to now have 88 people, I think, are here right now. Uh, just amazing, isn't it? But the two big things I want to point out that we have to carry forward from this gentleman is he has a big enough heart to include everyone un un unconditionally. Let me say that again. He reached out, others have said it this way, they'll, they'll give you a project, he'll give you a project if you don't have one. But it's actually the idea that everybody's included unless you write yourself out. And the, th the second most important thing is that he has a broad enough mindset to appreciate and embrace the differences that each one of us brings the perspective you need to the revolution. Let me say that again. He's broad enough to say, gosh, we might not know everything or we might not have it right, but you might, you might. And remember, our motto is that everyone in this room is an expert in something related to the Southern campaigns. Without further ado, uh, Leon and Charles, if you come up, We've got a gospel writer, a big, um, a big enough heart, and a broad enough mind. Charles wanted me to give the presentation, and I want him to give the presentation, so we're going to compromise by uh, doing a sort of dialogue, I guess. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Christine told me I could borrow her chair. I appreciate it. <laughs> Kind of like the guy in, in the Patriot. I'd like to learn how to make one. And every time I've ever attempted anything this complicated, I've done the same thing he did, just throw it away and use it for firewood. So uh, that's Mel Gibson. Um, I am um, very interested and have been in the works that other people have done. And so I've spent about the last 20 years looking at papers and working with people on writing papers and trying to get them published so that all this knowledge that is now available to us because of libraries and the internet, meetings like this that Carol and George have organized for the last 21 years, and that we're able to put together scholarship that none who came before us could put together. And um, I reread this um, paper that Leon and I worked on um, about um, uh, eight years ago or so, and I said, man, this has got a lot of documentation and it's over half footnotes. And Leon kind of laughed at me because he knows I have a little OCD in that area. And, and so um, I had originally um, got interested in these two sites because I really couldn't find anything much written down um, by them. And Wambaugh Creek Bridge, and Tidyman's Plantation, I'd never been there, really didn't know what happened at all, and, um, and I asked Leon to, to help me with it, and, and Leon, I'm telling you, when you get Leon to help you with something, you got somebody to help you with something. 
Um, the paper is published online. And two days ago, I said, well, I'll just print this paper off so I can reread it and have a little bit refreshed memory about it. And I found the link was broken. And so um, it's probably a good thing to go back and check things like that on the internet occasionally because people do contact me and say, hey, your website is broken. And, and generally it is. But we'll try to get that, that, um, that fixed so that if anybody wants to read the actual paper that this is um, based on, you can do it. Now, if I'm allowed to come back next year, which I may or may not be, I'm going to ask Carol to allow me to do something even more controversial than this presentation. I'm going to ask Carol to allow me to speak on Thomas Sumter. I was here, I was here about 10 years ago. I did not mention that name, and this crowd booed him. And that, to me, crushed me. Because that meant that David and I had failed in telling you the story of Thomas Sumter. And I know that's not what this is about tonight. But let me tell you this. There are two battles of critical importance that helped the war to be won in South Carolina, and that is Kings Mountain and the Battle of Cowpens. There are two precessor battles to Calpins that the Americans had to win, in my opinion, to win Calpins. One is Thomas Sumter's brilliant victory, and a little luck, at um, Blackstock's plantation. And the other one is William Washington and James McCall, South Carolina militia's victory, at a little and very um, unknown place called Hammond's Old Store. Thankfully, that's, in my, that's, in, my town. that's in your town. Yeah. And we had human memory had forgotten where that was. And thankfully, John Allison's team, with a little help from his friends, found it, has verified it. The Battleground Trust that David was up here talking about has purchased it. And with, our, with help from our friends in Lawrence County, South Carolina, that will be publicly available and interpreted so that you can get off the road and see where this incredibly important battle was that was a precursor to our victory at, um, at Calpins. Now, I know that's not why I'm up here, but I just felt that I was going to ask Carol that, and she may say, heck, no, you can't do that. Not at this crowd. But I think this crowd is mature enough now to take it. And so... So we hopefully will follow up sometimes with Andrew Pickens because we did have some absolutely amazing militia actions and militias working in South Carolina when there was no state government to back them up, not a penny to back them up, no supply chain whatsoever, and no continental army to come running to their relief if they screwed up and got in trouble. And so, yes, Francis Marion is absolutely the ringleader of that but there are some others and let me tell you this and that's what this presentation is kind of about these are all just people you know we we tend to love francis marion for what he stood for and put him up on a pedestal like admiral nelson and trafalgar square in downtown london but he was a he was a man he made the best decisions he could under the circumstances he found himself he was truly a leader because he had no money, he had no gunpowder, he had no salt, he had no rum. None of the things that 18th century people thought were important about fighting, yet he taught many, many, many leaders of men into following him into battle. And so I take nothing away from that. But his colleagues, his peers, General uh, Pickens and General Sumner, did the same thing. So Leon and I have the unpleasant duty today, sort of, of telling a little bit about when Francis Marion's wheel ran off the track. And the problem with great battle plans and great military leaders, I have been told by my military history buddies, is that all these plans are great until the first shot is fired. And then everything is thrown out the window, and the enemy has free action and they can change your plans in a big way. So we're going to talk about two actions very late in the war, 1782, 
a lot of people had said, oh, the war is over, we need to get home. And the problem with that is historians repeat that. The government repeats that. They pretend like that the American Revolution, well, the federal government has declared it was over on the, when the Declaration of Independence is signed. That's a pretty narrow-minded view of things. And secondly, when the victory at Yorktown was won, and um, after Utah Springs and South Carolina, it was over then. But evidently, the British in South Carolina didn't get the memo. Because this battle that we're going to talk about, these two battles, Leon and I will talk about it. They happened in 1782, and um, that's well after Yorktown, well after Utah Springs, and so um, uh, we're going to speak a little bit, frankly, about that. Now, General Green is the overall continental commander in the whole South, and reading through the amazing Green papers, you hear him in those papers uh, writing his wife letters and. Uh, reporting to Congress and reporting to George Washington, writing his friends in the Continental Army up north, you know, kind of telling it like it is. And um, he's still down here in the south um, trying really to slug it out. And things are really critical supply-wise, money-wise, PR-wise. A lot of the stalwarts have been wounded, gotten sick, gone home, and they're having real personnel crises. And the governor of South Carolina in October, late September of 1781, right after the Battle of Utah Springs, issued a proclamation, and it said that if you have been a loyalist and you will you know, swear allegiance to the rebel cause, and you will come and fight for six months, and you're not a particularly obnoxious character, we're going to give you a pardon. And so people who own property and who did not want to lose that property, and it became obvious to them that the um, rebel cause, and I say that because this is a, a, a y'all aren't gonna all run out of the uh, room screaming when I use that term, and that's, by the way, what the British called us. It's not a civil war term. It was, it was is a term that we were in rebellion. First thing King George said was these people are in open rebellion, and so we got called rebels. Not patriots. No, they didn't use that word in the 18th century to describe us. They well, that's, that's 20th century spin, by the way. We were rebels in rebellion, and um, so what we have is a lot of people, personnel, reporting to these units to fill in and to backfill. And so sometimes you wonder where the spinal column went in 1781. Well, a lot of it went to these reluctant, these reluctant newfound patriots who have signed up to do their six months of service, and a lot of them were signed up with Francis Marion to do that. And they weren't real zealots. <laughs> they were really just trying to save their own skin and, and rear ends. And so that may explain a little bit about what happened. Now, William um, Thompson is an interesting um, character. Um, I'm sorry, Benjamin Thompson is an interesting character. He was a scientist, basically, and he had done science at Spec, uh, science in Massachusetts, where he was from. And um, basically, he was very much a loyalist, and he uh, got run out of his hometown and went to Boston, and when the British withdrew from Boston, he went to England, and somehow made friends with George Germain who was the secretary for the colonies in the United States. And um, y'all, it's so hard for me not to interrupt these other speakers and add um, commentary, but um, I know that that's rude to do. I will tell you, by the way, that there were 26 British colonies in the Americas, and only half of them decided to secede, to put it in, in perspective. And these little colonies that Christine was talking about earlier, like Newfoundland or Nova, Nova Scotia and Quebec and all, those were British colonies like British East and West Florida that we tried to get to go and secede with us. And they say, nah, we like being British colonies, and some of them still are. And so, um, so you got to keep all this stuff in the grand context. Number two, and one of our other speakers said it really well earlier, by 1778 and 9, 
the American Revolution became a world war, and it was fully engaged. It was fought on every continent on, that was known except Antarctica. And so someone mentioned our friend John Robertson, and John um, did a, what he called his Global ga Gazetteer, and, um, and he identified battles that were in the general period of what we call the American Revolution. Um, and they were all over the world. Some of them were naval actions, and some of them were ground actions. A lot of them were in India, because India was um, a contested battleground for the French and the, and the British. So, Count, uh, so Rumsford goes to England, does more experiments on things like um, thermodynamics, and some people just still have rooms for stoves in their house they use. He didn't figure out how you design fireplaces and stoves to maximize the heat you get out of the fireplace and minimize how much hot air gets sucked up the chimney. Smart guy, experimenting on gunpowder and what have you. But they're so impressed with him, they give him the command of, I think, a fictional um, a troop of uh, cavalry that's up in uh, New England. So as navigation was not all that real swift in the 18th century, a storm blew the ship that he was coming from England back to um, New York and to Charleston, South Carolina. So he gets off in Charleston, South Carolina, and he says, well, you know, I am the new commander of this cavalry regiment. I didn't know that he'd ever been on a horse before, and he certainly had no military experience, but he was a buddy of George Germain, and that was good enough. And so, at that time, a Lord Cornwallis is a POW, and Lord Cornwallis' story it, it is interesting because he was exchanged for Henry Lawrence. And um, I won't divert myself into that story, although I am a little jacked up on steroids today, I'd like to tell you, but y'all you know, were wondering about who got exchanged for Cornwallis, well, it was uh, Henry Lawrence. So, um, he comes to Charleston, he tells Alexander Leslie, Major General, I would like to help you out. I'm from the government here, and I'm here to help you. And I, if you'll give me command of the light forces and the cavalry, which I've never commanded before, I'll do, what, I'll do some things you need doing. Nathaniel Green had imposed a very loose siege on Charleston. Now, when the British took Charleston, they took siege lines and shot, you know, uh, cannons and mortars into the city and all this. This was kind of a blockade, partial blockade, where Green is 10 or to 20 miles outside of Charleston. They're interdicting anybody who's trying to trade with, with Charleston and send them food and for forage and things like that. The problem with that is that the Americans did not control the sea lanes. And um, there was a good bit of fighting on the sea lanes, but basically the British could sail a ship into Charleston Harbor uh, and out anytime they wanted to. So it was kind of a, a loose siege as negotiations were going on by our friends, the Russians, who were mediating the settlement of at least the American cause and some other and some other things to try to end the war. So Thompson begins to collect up these odds and ends of cavalry forces that are in Charleston and around Charleston at the time. And so he knows that they have to be drilled and trained. And a lot of these guys probably really did not do much drilling and training. And Charleston had a big problem. And the problem was this. There were about 10,000 residents of Charleston that were still in Charleston. There was probably um, 15 or 20,000 enslaved African Americans in Charleston. And the Americans had pretty much segregated out all the loyalists, at least the ones they didn't like, and made, made them move to Charleston. So the British have to feed all those people. Well, you know, Charleston itself didn't have that many farms. They controlled a few sea islands around, they being the British controlled a few sea islands around Charleston, but it wasn't enough to feed people. And if a ship left Charleston going anywhere, then they had to provision that ship, meaning meat, 
And any livestock, of course, that you have, you've got to feed. So not only do they have all those people, if you have uh, 200 or 300 cowpermen, you know, you've got horses for them. Every officer wants to have a horse to ride, and you've got to feed those. And people still like hamburger and, and um, steaks and stuff back then. And if you've got a cow and you want to milk it or, or eat it, you've got to feed that too. By the way, the only source of power to wash your clothes and to cook your food and to heat your house in the wintertime was wood. And so one of the riches, by the way, of Henry Lawrence, for example, everybody says, well, he made all his money in the slave trade. He made a Mexican plantation's number one resource was timber, because you could put that timber on a barge or on a raft, or you could float it down to Charleston, and you could sell it for firewood, or you could sell it to be milled to make lumber out of. And Metcan had, I guess, originally 5,000 acres or so, David, I'm not sure what that number is, but, um, but it produced copious amounts of wood that the city of Charleston consumed. Now, when you have this force of troops, you want to take them on a test drive. And, of course, if you want glory, going out and rustling cattle and stealing forage doesn't really give you much glory. What would give you glory would be to run into Francis Marion's men and beat Francis Marion. And so Rumford, he didn't mind going out on this foraging mission, but he really wanted Marion. And so he leaves Daniel Island on his first foraging mission and um, goes up north toward Monk's Corner. He goes right up the road, I think it's 52, um, you know, that you can go up to Monk's Corner. And you can get across the headwaters of the western branch of the couple, 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 no, it's how my Charleston people say I'm doing okay with couple, couple, the couple river and cross over at Biggin Bridge or there's actually a four or four miles north of there where you can get over that so you can get on the east side. Now that was Francis Marion's area of operation near 1782 to enforce this loose siege that Green had organized. So Green had Charleston sort of surrounded by these mobile forces that were designed to interdict people like uh, Rumsford who are out, Count Rumsford who are out um, um, foraging. And so fortunately for Marion, or maybe unfortunately, Francis Marion and Hezekiah Mayhem have both been elected to the General Assembly. Francis Marion was a senator, Hezekiah Mayhem, who commanded one of the state troop cavalry regiments, um, was in the, in the House. They had gone into session in Jacksonboro, South Carolina, which is incredibly important because that restored elected civilian political leadership from Governor Rutledge, who was called Dictator Rutledge, because he had dictatorial powers, um, back into a legislative-run state. And so that showed the world in the peace negotiations that Christine has so eloquently talked about, is that South Carolina had restored itself to its own self-government, and that it was really not under control of the British only just downtown Charleston, and a radius of six or eight miles around Charleston is all that was really controlled by the British. So Rutherford goes on this mission. He really wants to bump into Marion. All he did is bump into about eight, an officer and six or eight soldiers at Strawberry Ferry. Strawberry Ferry is near Chillsbury, Childsbury, there's a, an extant 18th century beautiful chapel of ease there at Strawberry Ferry, so it's, you can't go on the grounds anymore. They've got cameras to take my picture if I try to get in there, and I can't climb the fence. And so um, we know exactly where those men were captured, but Marion's men had gotten wind of the fact that this forest expedition was off, and they withdrew 
from the headwaters of the western branch of the Cuppa River to the Santee River near Hampton Plantation, a place called Wambaugh Creek, and um, which is about 20, 22 miles away by, by road. So they were backing up from the British. Um, their leaders had problems. Number one, Mayhem and Marion personally were not there because they were in Jacksonboro at the General Assembly. Ori probably had something like malaria or something that comes and goes, and he was at home sick in bed. And so the officers who were in charge of the camp of three to four hundred soldiers, uh, a handful of Continentals, not many, but mostly state troops and militia, were about third tier um, commanders. Now, I'm not saying they were bad, I'm just saying that they weren't um, general officers and weren't um, field grade, mostly officers. And so um, we have Thompson returning to Daniel Island. And he has stolen some cattle. I mean, he's real proud of himself, so he stole some cow, cow, cattle to help feed the, the people um, who are uh, sequestered there in the Charleston um, area. But um, he had proved that his men could ride in good order, and he had, had proved, at least to himself, that they could capture six or eight of Marion's men if they wanted to, 300 of them. And, um, and he thought that they were quote unquote, kind of ready for prime time, if you will. And also, he had gotten like a good hunting dog, good rabbit dog, he got a sniff of the rabbit that he wanted to bag, or the fox, I guess I should say, instead of the rabbit. And um, so he was very anxious to take his troop out again once they rested the horses and go after that fox. And so only four days later, he took his troops out again. And uh, this time, having received intelligence that uh, Marion's men were at Wombach Bridge, he took a direct route of the King's Highway past <clears throat> St. James Santee Church, which is extant, and also Hampton Plantation. And This map here shows the, uh, the layout. We have one ball. Sorry. Confusing. We have one ball Creek Bridge, uh, where in the um, Hampton's men were camped on the south side of that. And you can see Hampton's plantation point where this doesn't work, so you have to follow the map on your own. This shows the approach of uh, Thompson towards Longwall Bridge and uh, Marion's Camp. At the tip of the arrow here, that position is shown in the next photograph. Thompson says as soon as they came out uh, on the road, they killed uh, a vedette from Marion's Camp. And they saw the rest of Marion's men retreating across the Wombaugh Bridge Creek, which you can see in the distance here. Uh, is there anything you want to interject here? Feel free to add as we go along. I'm just resting. Hmm? I said just resting. Oh, okay. <laughs> <clears throat> Incidentally, I first got interested in this topic when Charles. Uh, presented a photograph of this location and I spent half my time brought in the Francis Marion National Forest in the swamps and I said I have to go there and uh, so I started traveling around these areas and <coughs> contacted Charles about my interest and he and David Nealman had already done some work on that and so I just joined in on the uh, tidying up the bit they have already done. This is a 
view of the Wombaugh Creek Bridge uh, from the other side, the uh, American troops had retreated most of them across the bridge and were positioned at about the point where I am. You can see a, a bit of the Wombaugh Creek in the distance there on the left. I think this is the position of the original bridge because there was a long causeway on each side of the bridge and they wouldn't have bothered to dismantle that and there's no other causeway in the area so they must have used the old causeway and put the new bridge in afterwards. Thompson's men uh, charged the Americans and uh, most of them got across. Uh, approximately 300 of Mary and uh, didn't make it across. Defending against the British or Thompson's charge should have been pretty easy because uh, they would have had to form a narrow front crossing the bridge. And uh, unfortunately, that didn't happen that way. The uh, Americans formed uh, at the far end of the causeway to the north and allowed uh, many of the uh, of Thompson's militiamen to uh, approach within 30 yards. Provincial tried to cross, but the bridge was damaged and uh, they weren't able to uh, join the militia at the time for the main engagement. Americans fired their pistols and then scattered. And as Charles mentioned, these were mostly new made wigs. That's uh, Marion's term for the six months. Then the Tory, former Tories who wanted to save the property by serving six months. And they weren't very enthusiastic, as you can tell. And they did and scatter into the swamps. <coughs> Marion and Mayhem had left uh, Jacksonboro and had gone up to Mayhem's place uh, near Pineville. Uh, Marion got word of the revival at Wormall Bridge, and at 10 p.m. that night he took off, came down from the north uh, to um, try to rally his men. Thompson was very proud of himself, no doubt. Uh, he'd been in the saddle for probably about, about 20 hours, and at 2 a.m. he penned an after action, action report to uh, his commander, Leslie. This was his first time in battle, first time leading men, and the first one to defeat Francis Marion's troops. I think that's right. So he had a right to be proud, I guess. He had left his infantry at Rick's plantation. He rejoined them that evening after the engagement of one ball bridge. The next morning, he took a different route and approached Marion's troops from the northwest. Uh, Marion had collected many of them that, and uh, encamped them at Tagaman's plantation. This was the plantation of the 27-year-old widow, uh, Hester Rose Tagaman, whose husband had uh, died during the Charleston siege. I haven't been able to figure out what the cause of his death was. I, I do want to mention um, that the American mounted troops, the cavalrymen, uh, were armed with swords and pistols. And um, I'm not an 18th century pistol expert, but our understanding, my understanding is as a range of about 20 feet, the odds are you're going to hit the guy standing next to the guy you aim at. And so it's a very, very short range weapon. Many standard um, kits for cavalrymen included um, a short musket, often called uh, a, a fusil, I think. 
And sometimes they would even take a standard musket and just saw the end of the barrel off so that you would have a little bit longer range weapon, you know, if you weren't in a, in a knife fight. And so um, had the Americans had that little longer range weapon, they could have fired the 30 yards they were apart and, and maybe disrupted the British, but they just weren't at that time armed that way. And when you shoot a pistol in moss like they did, it creates a lot of noise and a lot of smoke, but it, in fact doesn't really do on the average very much damage. And then the next thing that a, a cavalry troop would do is charge um, into the enemy, swords drawn, and uh, at that point, the uh, Americans had a choice of either playing sword fight, parrying with these British troops, or taking off and scattering. I wonder how symmetric that battle was, because I think Gary's troops were mostly infantry, mounted infantry, where, whereas the Thompson's troops were trained cavalry. So. Well, you had O'Ree's cavalry there. That would have been about 60 or 70 men, probably. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, and then, uh, morning of February 25th, uh, Thompson's troops come down from the northwest. They enter the gate at Tidyman's Plantation. This is a view of where the gate would have been now. And they immediately spot uh, or, uh, Thompson's troops, I'm sorry, Marion's troops, among slave quarters, which I believe were located just where the road uh, and she's over a little rise in this photograph. Thompson wrote that uh, the field was perfectly clear in those days with the uh, defenses as obstruction. Uh, I, I mentioned this, emphasize this, because the account by William Gilbane James uh, says that the battle was disrupted by a pond. And uh, when I took Charles to this area the first time, he immediately spotted that this is all karst, all limestone, which is very porous, and the sand on top of that, it wouldn't have held a pond. So this is one case where we, one of many cases, where William Dove and James's account is not reliable. <clears throat> and incidentally, I don't know if this had any bearing on it, but <clears throat> William Domain James was an alcoholic and uh, lost his judgeship because uh, of the alcoholism that rendered him, quote, imbecilic. So I, I think uh, James's history has to be read with great deal of caution. We found a plaque showing the uh, Titan Plantation and you can see, if you look at these uh, dotted lines that converge towards the, the lower left of the middle, uh, I believe those were probably where the slave quarters were, and the dotted lines represent paths coming to and from the slave quarters. The rectangle uh, towards the center is where uh, Tidyman's house was, and that has been confirmed by archaeology. Notice also, uh, uh, just parallel and to the south of the main course of the San Quentin River, there is a creek called here uh, Manigold's Creek, but the modern name for it is Chicken Creek. It is not named for anything that Marianne did, but rather for George Chicken, who was one of the early uh, settlers in the area. This plan is remarkably accurate, as you can see by comparing the present United States Geological Survey out. And this shows where the slave quarters were, where Marion's troops were encamped, and uh, the house, and then the uh, road leading through the slave quarters to the house. And this is, was the uh, Road on which the engagement occurred. Chicken Creek is um, 
not what we normally think of as a creek. Um, number one, it's got a huge flow of water in it, and it comes out of the Santee River and then flows through a swamp and back into the Santee River. So it's where the Santee River begins to divide from one river into the North Santee and the South Santee River. So if you're going out toward Georgetown, Charleston on Highway 17, you go over the South Santee River first, then you go over a large flat um, lowland floodplain island that was all rice paddies, then you cross the North Santee River. And so here, Chicken Creek is part of the flow that establishes the South Santee River. So it's not a creek like Wildball Creek, that, which drains many acres and goes for about 20 miles. And so the Tidyman Plantation and um, probably some rice paddies in the area, if they could have gotten the, the, the earth to hold water, um, would, would have been fed by the springs and stuff around Chicken Creek. And this uh, map here shows Thompson's cavalry and Marion's troops formed for battle. Thompson says uh, they had no difficulty forming. The small red rectangular, rectangle in the rear represents his reserve in case uh, things didn't go well for Thompson. Now, here's where things go off the rails, Mr. Wolf mentioned. Uh, and I'll just read this because I can't describe it any better than they do. Thompson wrote, as soon as the, troop, uh, the troops were formed, he ordered the charge to be sounded and the line moved forward. And then we also sounded the charge, and instead of coming out to meet us, they were discovered going off to the right, their right, in the greatest hurry and confusion and attempting to flee into the swamp. Uh, that was a point that back to the river side. Uh, Thompson and others confused Chicken Creek with uh, the main course of the Santee River. Thompson says they immediately charged them at full speed and had good fortune to come up in time to cut off a great part of the army. Marion's account agrees remarkably well with that of Thompson. We lost a fine opportunity to cut the enemy's horse to pieces by a man's horse, not charging as it was ordered. But I believe it was principally owing to Captain Smith not telling his officers and men what they were going about. This Captain Smith was uh, John Carraway Smith. But apparently, uh, Marion didn't hold a grudge because later John Carraway Smith was promoted from captain to major. Marion did manage to rally a part of his horse less than half a mile away and sent them to cover the scattered men. And Thompson never followed wisely. He wouldn't pursue them into the swamp. Royal Gazette uh, reported the next day that many were killed in the river. They confused Chicken Creek with the river again. Uh, Numbers were drowned. It is imagined that General Marion must have shared their fate as he was among those who took the water and from his age could not be supposed to be kept it better, get better off than his followers. Reports of his death were exaggerated, of course. <laughs> and Marion and his reputation survived uh, the embarrassing defeat. Mary had learned never to entrust his troops to others to command during the war. And so he did return to his, uh, to Jackson, or serve on the Senate during the war. And he soon managed to recruit, recruit uh, new troops to replace the ones that had scattered, including many uh, more you made rigs, including his old enemy, Micah uh, Gagney, and they fought well under him about a half year later. 
uh, at uh, Orchard Plantation. Uh, so, um, Leon and I had lots of discussions because, in essence, Marion's troops did nothing but run with Marion sitting on a horse in front of them, commanding them. And so we said, well, why would that happen? And why on earth would the British not chase them down? Uh, the only way really out of, of Titan's plantation, besides going through the British line, was to exit um, uh, to the American right, because there's a sandy ridge there, um, and, and you, that was the way out. Evidently, the men knew that. My guess is, and this is pure Charles speculation, is that Marion's reputation from Parker's Ferry about setting an ambush was on the British leader's mind. And if they had gone tearing off after, if this had been the plan, which I don't think it was, but if this had been the plan, then the British could have ridden right into a trap similar to how the British rode into Marion's trap one mile west of Parker's Ferry when the British got chopped up pretty bad. With Thompson is Frazier, Thomas Frazier, Major Thomas Frazier, who got almost killed at Parker's Ferry when he was unhorsed and the rest of the horses ran over him. And so um, I doubt he had lost that lesson. Secondly, I don't think Marion would have ever made a plan that required him to jump in a river when the river was probably about 45 degrees and swim away from people shooting at him. That's just not a good military exit strategy. <laughs> and, and so I, I think that what we see is what we get, and that is ineffective leadership on the secondary level, uh, John Carraway Smith, doesn't communicate well with his men, and when they see all those red coats confronting them, they decide that to exit the battlefield without firing a shot or swinging a sword. Now, why would Charles Baxley want to come up here and tell you all that? I think that you need to view Marion as a human, as a person, because Marion was certainly deeply embarrassed by his men's performance deeply embarrassed. They got beat at Wambaugh Creek Bridge and they ran the next day with Marion standing in front of them looking at them. So it's not like they swore, snuck off out of camp. They ran. They ran. But Marion had great eyes, contributed mightily to the war effort. But Marion didn't always win. And in this case, Marion got humiliated. And his reputation did survive this. Now, archaeologist Steve Smith is here, and Steve has done a little bit of archaeology at, at um, both of these places, and he may have a different interpretation, and I don't think Steve and I have ever talked about it. Um, but Steve is the foremost conflict archaeologist around here, and is an expert in Francis Mary. Both of these sites are in the Francis Marion National Forest. Neither one of them is marked. I hope that we'll be able to um, figure out how to do that, Mike, and get permission from the National uh, Forest to interpret these battles on site. But you can go there. I was talking with one of my friends uh, a few years ago and telling him about Tidyman's plantation. He's a guy who uh, lives in Mount Pleasant. And when I described where it was, he said, well, that is my favorite turkey hunting place. I've been out there many times and sat on the ground and done my turkey calls and stuff like that. But he didn't know he was sitting right on an American Revolutionary battlefield. And so one of the things that we all have to do is mark these things because it would be a tragedy to see them get plowed up and made into a housing development or 7-Eleven or something like that. And I don't think there's any damage or danger of that here where this is since it's pretty remote and it's in the Marion National Forest. But I hope that you go to the website, download the maps, 
They're easy, these two sites are easy to find. Uh, Tidyman's plantation is crow flies. It's about 1.8 miles away from Lumball Creek Bridge. And as Leon said, based on our conversations with the uh, Francis Marion Forest um, archaeologist, um, we believe that the modern bridge is pretty much built on top of where the um, 18th century bridge would have been. So you can stand there, you can look at it, there are low areas on both sides of Wambaugh Creek where there were rice um, paddies built. And where the Americans lined up is pretty much where the horses could stand without sinking in the mud. And so they are on the first high ground north of Wambaugh Creek. And um, so that is the story. That is the story. You <laughs> do brought the subject of why uh, Thompson didn't pursue. I tried following the route that uh, Marion's troops may have tried to take through the swamp, and uh, through the swamp, and you can't get very far. And I don't think cavalrymen like to get off their horses. And that is definitely not horse uh, country through that swamp. It's full of cypress knees. It would cripple a horse in no time. Uh, so, I think that's probably the good explanation. Oh, this is another view of Chicken Creek emphasizing probably not swimming. Well, Thompson liked to keep busy, and uh, he went to North Carolina, back to New York, and uh, took command of his regiment, but he, of course, never saw any further action because there was no fighting to do in uh, New York State. Afterwards, he went to Bavaria. He liked to keep busy, uh, as the title of this book uh, suggests. And in his spare time, he found time to uh, establish workhouses for the poor, uh, create a public park, and do experiments in thermodynamics. In fact, I first heard about Alias Benjamin Thompson uh, more than 50 years ago. I was a lecturer at Penn State in the introductory physics course. And I used to talk about how Benjamin Thompson, Count Lumford, discovered that you never run out of heat when you're grinding cannon barrels. Up until that time, it had been thought that heat was a form of matter. And if that were true, of course, you'd run out of the matter eventually grinding cannon barrels. So this led to a, a whole a revolution in the way of thinking about uh, heat and energy. So he's better, Count Lumford is better known among physicists than probably Benjamin Thompson is among revolutionary historians. He took his name Count Lumford, by the way, from uh, Lumford, New Hampshire, which is now Count Lumford. New Hampshire, and showed that there were no hard feelings to be invited to join the American Academy of Arts and Sciences later on. This paper uh, that Charles referred to at the beginning, there's referenced here if you want to look it up from 2016. Uh, David Newland is co author of that paper, so there are three of us who are contributors. And Charles will try to answer any questions you may have. Thank you.